after the game, and certainly that was a gut-wrenching emotional loss, and, and uh, I was frustrated and kicked something that I shouldn't have kicked and, and uh, thought I was okay, but journaling of the game wore off, and before anybody starts the narrative, like the head football coach is frustrated and lost his poise and all that, no, I care. And um, uh, I care about these kids, and I was really upset on Saturday night because I didn't do enough to help them uh, get over the hump and win the football game. So don't think I have to have surgery, but there is a broken bone in my foot. It hurts like you know what, but, you know, I've got to show toughness and fight through it. You know, it's a damn shame that Shane Beamer can't stop putting his broken foot in his mouth in these press conferences because I think a lot of South Carolina fans really want to like him. And I think a lot still do. Trust has been shaken, apparently, over the last couple of weeks versus Florida, giving up a ton of yards, a ton of points. In the game, they felt like they could have won based on their offense's performance at home. And then the abysmal first half effort versus Mizzou, just not picking up where they left off from last year, this year. Obviously, they're missing a lot of troops. They're super banged up. But Shane Beamer in these press conferences with these goofy excuses like the hot dogs with the chain guys in the game one, him coming out and just getting in front of the media, telling everybody he kicked something and broke his foot last week. I mean, I like Shane Beamer. It's just a little goofy. And when you start losing a bunch of games, his quirkiness, his his uh, little frustrated frustration shtick, it, it kind of gets cold. And I think a lot of fans are upset about it. But South Carolina is just having a really bad year, man. And Texas A&M desperately needs a get-right game. It seems like the perfect storm for something special in College Station coming off of a bye week after two brutal losses. All right, guys, Texas A&M South Carolina preview video. We're going to talk about it. It's a big game for Texas A&M. You're going down the home stretch of your season. You have five games left, and you've got to set the tone going into these because you have a couple of really, really brutal road games. So it's time to get right. So let's talk about it. Let's break down some of the matchups, some of the keys to victory for Texas A&M some keys moving forward through the season. But first, please like and subscribe. It helps me greatly. Let's get into it. All right, so the best player on South Carolina is Spencer Rattler. He's been good through the ups and the downs. He just does not have a lot of damn help. Offensive line, abysmal. They have seven injured players, and they weren't even going to have a great year to begin with before those injuries, I don't think. And it shows. If there's a third and more than four yards, he's under pressure. He's probably going to hit the ground on that play. But he's really scrappy. He can make lemonade. But just the sheer amount of bodies that are around him on a consistent basis even makes that difficult for him. I think if Spencer Rattler, at his level of play now, is on a team with a serviceable O-line, you're talking like potential fringe Heisman conversation. He's a really good quarterback. He just does not have any damn help. Receivers, not bad. But their two best ones are hurt in Juice Wells and Leggett, who is questionable this week. Obviously, he's their best receiver. You've heard about him. You've seen him in highlights. Don't know if he's going to play. Obviously, that bodes really well for A&M. You hate to not play a team at full strength. But at this point, we're going to take whatever help we can get because you desperately need a win. We'll talk about A&M in a second. Nick Harbour, young, true freshman, superstar athlete type of body, like tall and track speed combined. He's been getting a lot of contested one-on-one -on -one grabs. These last two games, he's really started emerging. I think Nick Harbour is going to be a name the SEC fans across the country, across the SEC, are going to recognize on an instance in a couple of years. He's going to be a really, really good player at wide receiver. But he's coming into his own right now. Still doesn't really fully know what he's doing, but if he just goes out there and runs a route, there's a good chance he's going to make a play. So that's a guy that I'm kind of fearful of for Texas A&M. Kind of an under-the-radar name. I'm sure they're going to address it in film. But A&M's had a lot of trouble with the deep ball. You don't know what they're going to do shuffling bodies around after finding that DeBerry is super solid in nickel where he played last game versus Tennessee. And Deuce Harmon actually playing a really solid game, manning that corner spot the entirety of the Tennessee game. You wonder what kind of shuffling they're going to do there and if that can kind of calm down the, the, the deep balls that have been plaguing A&M since pretty much all year, but especially in that Bama game. That's the kind of guy that can make you pay on that. And if Rattler even has an a, a, a extra second of time on a given play, he can make it happen. Texas A&M's front seven should absolutely have a field day against South Carolina's offense and offensive line specifically. Running, they don't really have any elite running backs. Their O-line's bad. They got a pretty good quarterback. 
So A&M needs to make the most of it and not let Spencer Rattler get comfortable. Spencer Rattler has actually not really been a good road quarterback this year for whatever reason. I'll put the splits on the screen. But he's passing for 58% on the road, where he's passing for around 80% at home. So just kind of a different quarterback on the road. You really hope that A&M is able to force him to continue that trend. Because if he gets going, that's, that's, that's the kiss of death for A&M. They also have a really good tight end in Trey Knox, transfer out of Arkansas. All reliable, good hands. He's always there in the flat as a check down. Great player that A&M definitely needs to address. I will say, though, A&M has been solid in the short passing game this year. A&M has been solid in getting people on the ground this year. In, in my opinion, tackling hasn't been an issue. So just got to maintain the status quo there. But he's a guy that can make you pay. He's reliable. He's there. He's a good, he's a good player. So between Harbor and him, those are two sure-fired weapons that South Carolina is going to be using against A&M. You look out for Leggett, see if anything comes of that, and if any other bodies get healthy. But it sounds like they're going to continue to be banged up this week. Offensively, for Texas A&M, this is where the get-right needs to happen. You're going up against a team that does not have a good secondary. They're big, but they're not super quick. They're not great in coverage. And versus Missouri, they were really bad at tackling. They have one player. Let me check his name out because it's actually kind of hard to pronounce. I have to look at it to say it. Eamon Wari, number 21, I believe, uh, cornerback. They move him around. He's got like a linebacker build. He's probably their best DB, but he got hurt this year, and he hasn't really fully come back into his own after coming back from that injury versus North Carolina. But look out for him to be a solid player in that secondary. Safeties are super young, and corners aren't the most athletic for DBs. And Texas A&M should be full go at wide receiver this week. It's no secret that Evan Stewart has been playing hurt. He's been playing with a bum ankle, and who knows what else he's been dealing with. He's been hit hard this year. Remember that big hit he sustained at the end of the Arkansas game? He's had a couple of hits like that this year. He really needed this week off, and I think he should be at 100% this week because he was not injured enough to not play, but he was definitely playing hurt. So that tells me that there was some rehab and some stuff he could have worked through, and I think he probably did over this two-week break. Noah Thomas, obviously, has been way less than 100% over the last few weeks. Missed about three games after getting hurt early in the year. He came, kind of came into the season banged up, and it se he seemed to have aggravated it early in the season. But with two weeks off and not having the most reps over the last few games, you really feel like you're getting your, your really good trio of receivers back in Noah Evan, and Anias. They don't also don't have a great pass rush. They're averaging under two sacks a game, uh, South Carolina. So this offensive line has a chance to kind of get back into that form that they had before the Bama game, where I thought they were taking incremental steps forward, playing decent to good games versus Arkansas and Auburn. I think we can start seeing that again as long as their confidence hasn't been shaken. Plus, having the bye week off, reflecting on your woes, and just having a get-right attitude this week, which we all hope they have. So this offense has a chance to really, really move the ball this week after such frustrating performances the last two weeks before. So I'm going to go ahead and give you my score prediction now, but I'm going to talk more about what this game means for Texas A&M. I have A&M winning this game big. A&M is currently a 14-point favorite, uh, according to Vegas oddsmakers. I think A&M covers, and I think they cover by another score. I think they win 38-17. to I think this is a feel-good, get-right game for A&M. But this is on A&M, I think. I, I think they should outmatch the injured and kind of snowballing downhill South Carolina. But if they don't, and if they sleepwalk versus a game where they're supposed to get right in, that bodes terribly for the future of the season. Even if A&M goes out there and wins this game in a close back-and-forth battle... Knowing what South Carolina is dealing with right now, knowing what they are and what they are not this year, I think that really hurts A&M. If you want to have a chance versus Ole Miss, if you want to have a chance versus LSU to end the year, you have to get some things right now when you absolutely can. The opportunity is too golden for A&M not to take it. So A&M must get right versus South Carolina because they've just presented the opportunity to do so. I think Max Johnson has a chance to have a 300-yard game versus South Carolina. I think Le'Veon Moss can run for 80 yards. I think you can get 150 yards rushing this game and 300-plus yards passing. I think it's on the table. You're at home. You had two weeks off, and you had the worst two games of your season as your most recent games under your belt. It's time to get right. It's time to make things right. 
and it's time to put a stamp on the end of this season for Texas A&M. And I'm predicting that they will, but if they don't, I'm probably going to predict a couple more losses on this season. So guys, tell me what you think about this game. Tell me what your score prediction is. Do you believe with me? Am I being a little bit too positive on A&M? I mean, South Carolina is not good this year, guys. It's a bad year for South Carolina. They had a really good, really, really positive year last year under Shane Beamer. But that's not the team that we're dealing with this year. That game last year was the game where I knew A&M was screwed for the year. You know, the way that that game opened up last year. This is also a revenge game if you don't, if you think about it that way. They opened the game up with a kickoff return. And from that point on, it's like, okay, we're going to lose South Carolina. This is happening. First loss since joining the SEC to South Carolina. A&M, they go out, they make it right, and they move forward with a big game versus Ole Miss on the road after. So, guys, thanks for watching. Like and subscribe. I'll see you in the next one. Gig'em.